Welcome and thank all of you for coming to get a primer on travel clothing in the medieval world. Of course, for this we've got to establish a little bit of context, but I'm glad that you're here, this trust dude symposium. Of course, we've got to establish some sort of scope, since I'm playing slightly fast and loose with what I'm considering travel clothing here. Or specifically what I'm considering clothing here. Essentially, we're looking at items that could be worn or carried by a single person while traveling throughout medieval Europe. Mandatory disclaimer, this is just an overview. I would have loved to go further in depth on some of these garments, but given the scope, that would have been like a two hour long video. I've provided resources in the description if you'd like to get into more detail with items and that will also have my bibliography. In order to best establish the ideas of what wardrobe would be available to a person who's traveling, us hobby medievalists have to first address the broader context for who would be on the roads in medieval Europe and for what purposes. Starting with some of the people who are on the lower socioeconomic rung of the ladder. Villains, if you weren't already aware, are a term for the tenant farmers who were legally bound to put the land upon which they serve in the English manorial system. They filled the space between enslaved persons and a freeman. When it comes to travel for these people, quite a few legalities were involved, but they still could, technically. The lands could pay to live beyond the manorial land, or were fined for not paying these fees, and could also travel to market days. Another thing mentioned by Guy in their work, Life in a Medieval Village, which while a bit tertiary, draws from specifically the records of one village in northern England. Mentions villains occasionally breaking these legal bonds by dwelling in the city for a year and a day without being caught, which provides some incentive for leaving their homes behind. Local markets could also draw them away from the manor for selling produce or other goods, Though these folks would not be traveling so far as perhaps the Champagne fairs of Troyes or Provence. Other times, one's work could be the main cause for travel. Be you a mason whose work could take them from city to city as your talents were needed, or a medical professional who <laughs> just might want to go to the next well-paying job before, I don't know, maybe a cataract surgery proves to not go very well. These are all reasons for traveling the extensive roads and footpaths of the land alongside troubadours and couriers. The nobility, however, were playing a completely different game when it comes to personal travel. We're talking massive entourages, wagons of furniture and finery, the whole shebang. So travel for the nobility was something that also had a number of causes. Sometimes it was as simple as traveling between various estates and holdings to exercise their authority over vassals and collect taxes. Other times it was attending the courts of their own respective lords and paying their homage to them. For tournaments or war or diplomacy, it was very regular to see nobility on the move with wealthy landowners even lengthening their travels to stay at various hunting lodges or to take time with other pleasure-seeking pursuits. I know hunting with falcons while on the road is a very common thing to do. All of this is before we talk about merchants, war, and pilgrimage, which are all massive reasons to travel on their own, with their own associated support networks and reasons behind them. The Bartered ba Body, for example, has a brilliant discussion on the reasons one could have for taking a pilgrimage, be it for making up for a crime that one did, or even just a spiritual goal. And William Way backs these reasons up as well in his own itineraries, which are written in the 15th century. One of the greatest discomforts on the medieval road was the weather, where rain turned ill-kept roads into muddy pits that men, beasts, and carts could easily get trapped in. The midday heat was also uncomfortable, especially when you get to Jerusalem and the Holy Land, with Ibn Battuta noting in the mid-14th century that people tended to avoid traveling in the afternoons 
instead traveling in the mornings and evenings where it's much cooler. Mediterranean winds during winter made sea voyages an even greater hazard than sea voyages already are, and the cold of the Alps, a very frequent route to take on travel, was deadly to exposed voyagers. As a result, it was important to be prepared for the weather and be able to find shelter from the worst of it. Clothes are probably the most universal item for travel in, well, most of history. They can keep you warm, help delay the rain from soaking you through, and serve as decent bedding without too much extra bulk in your packing. I find it hard to go in depth on them because of this, since so much of it seems standard and you've pretty much heard before, but they really are your one-stop shop for travel outerwear, especially since they can be worn from a lower class to an upper class impression. Materials and shaping would really be what define the difference between the level of your impression, though with the thriving secondhand clothing industry in Europe, well, that is a tangent for another day. I would love to talk about it. As fashion changed, the medieval cloak changed with it. In the early medieval period, they are essentially a woolen blanket that you would pin over one shoulder. And this also happened before, but medieval period is our scope here. And a great example is this cloak in a wonderful reproduction of the 5th century Camothan warrior's burial. It's really easy to see how this could be used double as bedding, since it's basically a throw blanket tossed around your shoulders. The more cloaks came to have shaping evolved, a little more work is required to see it as bedding, but you can still very easily wrap yourself up in it. Towards the 12th and 13th centuries, semicircular cloaks came into fashion. Finally, in the 14th century, we can start to see shoulder shaping like on accents like the box and bogman's cloak. I will preface this next section that among scholars there remains some debate about what the French term garde de corps really referred to in the medieval era. Some say it was a loose, flowy garment with shorts or no sleeves. Others say it's long hanging sleeves were the most distinguishing feature about it. It also likely had an incorporated hood, but at least one scholar has tried to claim that the garde de corps it is a close-fitting short garment. Given that these are garments most attested to in the 13th and mid-14th centuries, however, that last option is probably the least likely. And this is especially because they're described as in both masculine and feminine wardrobes, and being gifted between the two. Generally, costumers have decided that the term garde corps refers to the traveling coats of the 13th through mid-14th century, which feature hoods, long hanging sleeves, sometimes depicted with pleats in the back quarter of the sleeve head, with slits in the front to leave the arms free, and a long length even on men. They were perfect for traveling, with a hood to keep the rain from your face, and sleeves that can warm your arms in a chill, with but left off in the warmer weather. These are frequently depicted on doctors and traveling ladies, though there are brasses of men who funded portions of church complexes who are depicted wearing that in their death. Now we're on to footwear. This was probably the hardest thing to find resources on riding boots. I knew they were a thing, but whenever I started looking, I couldn't find much. Mark Carlson led me to terms uh, gamash and brodequin, and yet while looking into them, all I could find was that they were shoes. Luckily, the wonderful Henrik, whose Instagram is there, lent me some information from their copy of Stepping Through Time and Archaeological Footwear to really better inform this section of the video. The definition of boot used in Stepping Through Time is a shoe that lacks an enlarged opening and means a closure. And this construction was used to protect from or to protect the wearer from water, dust, and temperature. It also, according to the book, helps to protect from injuries. The water protection here is very important, and it's viewed that the more seams there are in a boot or a shoe, the less watertight it is. And the best boots were especially well-oiled. Riding boots especially were associated with the wealthy, since while the definition of boot has no relationship to height, Riding boots that we see in medieval artwork are, well, 
thigh high. You're wearing these not only to protect your legs from weather, but to show off that you can afford the whole cow. As time went on, and especially towards the 16th century, riding boots became less associated with just the upper classes of the military, but the military in general, where we can see them depicted in the woodcuts, the wagon train on the Lanskanesh, who aren't necessarily the wealthy, or the most upper class, but they sure are wealthy. Another boat note on boots in general is that this waterproof quality is also why they tend to be quite favored by sailors, and most of our extant examples are actually from boats. Another interesting type of footwear that we see for travel are skis and snowshoes. Skis have been found in Scandinavia since the Neolithic, and medieval skis have been found both there in Scandinavia and Russia. These enabled quicker travel over the snow, which also helps hunters. Skiers in the medieval world would use one or no poles, much unlike our current our modern method with two. Snowshoes in Scandinavia also appear to be less common than skis. Well, in general, skis aren't as common outside of Scandinavia and Russia in the medieval era. Snowshoes, however, are attested in the 14th century Alps for aiding finding people who had been lost in the snow. So snowshoes, save your life. <laughs> Proper provisioning can also make or break a journey, which is why William Way, in his itineraries, spends multiple chapters discussing what he bought for the journey. The next few items are more typical items for carrying your supplies, though there are also things like baskets or ways to carry items not on your person, like carts or pack animals. Scripts were a garment that were very useful for carrying necessary supplies, like food rations, while on our journey. They're often depicted as haversacks, or like a messenger bag, slung over one shoulder, and tend to be associated with pilgrims. Milanese pilgrim uh, Santo Bresca, or Brasca, Santo Brasca, recommended having two bags one very full of patience, and the other containing 200 Venetian ducats, or at least 150. Which, I don't know about you, is some pretty great travel advice. <laughs> it leaves so much room for souvenirs, and you definitely need that much patience on a journey. There's also a less need to worry about this being too little food for a long journey, because especially if you're a pilgrim, there are hospices typically placed about a day's journey apart on most major pilgrimage routes, and monasteries were bound by duty to aid travelers seeking rest, though this frequently led to um, near bankruptcy when too many people took advantage of this hospitality without leaving a donation for the church. Due to this, a lighter load is honestly preferable when pre traveling. Once again, I will reiterate, you're not typically just out there in the wilderness, you are traveling from location to location, and you will find inns and hospices and hotels along the way. Backpacking was very different in the medieval world than it is now. <laughs> Another very common item for carrying things on foot was something referred to as a wallet in the works of Chaucer. These are not very much like our modern wallets, depicted as much larger and typically of a creamy colored cloth, probably linen. It's far more similar in construction to market wallets, and are pictured as slung over a shoulder, over a stick, or, as in Chaucer, lay before him in his lap while on a horse. They are depicted as having two separate pockets, and are held by the middle so that the contents cannot fall out. Something I notice in visual depictions is that they're very frequent in depictions of the flight into Egypt. Much like the Pilgrim's script, they appear quite broadly across ages, so they're likely going to show up for whatever location you're looking into for your impression. Now, everyone knows the rule of threes. A person can go three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food. As a result, water rations are incredibly important to think about when preparing for a journey. Now, not everyone can follow William Way's advice and have two barrels of wine and one barrel of water on their trip, but a small canteen? Now that would work. This also is referred to as a costrel, and it is the perfect option for someone traveling by foot. These appear in a couple of forms, between leather pear-shaped vessels to straight up 
peg-shaped ones that can be attached to belts, which I think are really cool. These pear-shaped ones were shaped and stitched together out of leather and then sealed with tar or pitch. And if you'd like more information on how to make these, our very own Grant is hosting a live stream showing the process. So, editing Faye here with these leather ones, it seems. While we do have a couple of these extants, they're mostly from the Mary Rose for the leather costals, and in the medieval era proper, we see more of ceramic canteens and wooden costrels. Others were made out of staves of wood, just like kegs and barrels. No matter the body construction, however, they were corked with wood and commonly fitted with a shoulder strap or other sort of handle. We have seen ones directly attached to your belt, and those are the funniest ones in the world to me. Finally, we are approaching, probably, the most iconic parts of travel on the medieval road, which are pilgrim's badges. These are wearable tokens that you could acquire at medieval shrines as souvenirs from completed pilgrimages. Most of these are made from lead, which is soft, cheap, and really easy to melt down. Few texts actually reference them specifically, and they tend to only be anecdotal. Our best sources for these are actually miracle collections, where pilgrims reference them while talking about miracles they experienced on their journeys. Other appearances occur in criticism of them, like when Erasmus satirized a wearer of pilgrim signs, and the tale of Varen has Chaucer's Miller and Pardoner rob a stall of these signs. As the medieval era goes on, these badges take on a secondary role as being associated with beggars and frauds. Our most direct reference to Pilgrim's Badges and Ampulae comes in the Liber Melorum from sometime after 1186, which describes the small metal ampulae made to be filled with Canterbury water, aka water marked with a drop of Thomas Becket's blood. These were worn around a pilgrim's neck, and Liber Melorum has a ton of information on the symbolism of these items as viewed in the day, which is frankly really interesting and I adored reading it. I fear this video would get too long if I begin to get into all of the deep religious symbolism, but I would like to touch on how, since lead was considered the least precious of metals, the transformation of it into this very important religious object has a deep relation with the ideals of Christianity at the time, and a mirrored relationship to the transformation of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And Pulai for pilgrims crop up in sources around the late 1130s, though this source, the Pilgrim's Guide to the Santiago de Compostela, seems to imply that the selling of these pilgrim signs was an established practice. They spread quickly through other pilgrimage sites, to the point where they were being sold at Canterbury a year after Beckett's uh, murder. I mean, martyrdom. <laughs> Talk about enterprising there. <laughs> Around the 14th century, we begin to see more badges, and these take a multitude of forms. Of course, there are the Annunciation badges attributed to the city of Aachen, which have also been found as far as Sour outside Nazareth. I probably mispronounced that. The decapitated head of Thomas Beckett is very another very popular one. But I know the ones you're all truly wanting me to talk about, which is the badges of genitals. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to note here that the attitudes of medieval people are quite different than ours when it comes to the natural body, and especially the naked body. Pious phalluses and holy vulva's introduction spends a lot of time building up the context to this, and finding more not-safe-for-work content alongside religious content isn't out of the ordinary for the medieval world. We'll never really know what these badges meant or symbolized at all. Reese makes strong arguments for these badges being a blend of satire and genuine religious symbolism, given that some of these badges mirror more standard pilgrims' badges, and from one account of the 14th century, may be able to be bought in the same locations as normal pilgrims' badges. These are all theories, however, and I'm sure most of you will be happy to know that they exist. They are historically valid, and they're very often found at the same sites as normal pilgrims' badges. Now, I didn't cover other standard travel items like a broad-brimmed hat 
or hoods and that's because I mean how much can you talk about a hat and I've already done a video about hoods <laughs> walking sticks are another example um, you have them there's not much I can really say but I can say that broad brimmed hats are very important because I was at an event yesterday and this is what happens I have a tan line for my curl, a sunburn line for my curl. Covering your skin is very important in hot weather, as in cold weather, because the sun is a deadly laser. Thank you for watching this lovely cozy video. And if you enjoyed this and you want to learn more about medieval clothing and sometimes the social context of everything, give me a subscribe. If you enjoyed this, like and comment. And if you want to see more real-time updates on what I'm doing, follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Sterling Seamstress. If you want to help the channel out with me improving tech and everything, drop a donation in my Ko-fi. And I'll see you in two weeks with another special episode before we return to our every third Monday schedule. Thank you! Man, it is weird to be in front of a camera again. How many books are too many in this background? Because I think I could use with more. I could do more. Maybe I'll get some more books. That's the devil speaking. Everyone knows the rule of threes. That would have been more effective if I had something in it.